Uh, Menendez and his 800 colonists arrived here, as we've said. Uh, there were, it was a big expedition. When you think that Jamestown began with fewer than 100 people, uh, Menendez's expedition is really uh, quite a comparison. And uh, this didn't last here at St. Augustine. Within a couple of months, they were down to about 200 people, both through death and through Menendez sending hundreds of soldiers off to the various forts that Jerry just described in, in the talk earlier. Um, but it had an impact. They did settle in this domain of Saloy. Saloy was a sub-chief under Satariwa. He allowed the Spaniards to settle in his area. And uh, the settlement lasted only for nine months. Uh, we know that they built what they considered a fortified town or a fort. Uh, but by April of the next year, there was enough Indian d d discontent. Someone shot a burning arrow into the storehouse, the Casa de Municiones, blew up part of it. There was also a rebellion on the part of the soldiers. Uh, and at that point, Menendez made a bold decision and decided instead of just leaving or relocating, uh, out of Florida, he just picked up the town and moved it over to Anastasia Island, which is just across the bay. Uh, no one has ever found a trace of that. So we have the first uh, encampment. I'm condensing a, a lot here. Up in this area, where the Fountain of Youth and the Mission are, 1566, they moved over to Anastasia Island lasted there for seven years, hundreds of people, taverns, shops, homes, a fort, barracks, not a trace or an artifact has ever been found of that. In 1572, they relocated the town and came back to where we are today in St. Augustine, where the plaza is. I'm convinced that the only reason they could get back here in 1572 was the either pacification or elimination of the saltwater Tamuqua. Uh, there simply was too much resistance for Spaniards to get back here. Interestingly, the people here of Satariwa and Siloy, the saltwater Tamuqua, are the only Tamuqua group who never sent an envoy or never came to St. Augustine to pledge allegiance to the Spaniards and get gifts and so on, the things that, that Amy Bushnell was telling us about today. Uh, so they may have just really been um, hunted down, annihilated, it's really difficult to tell, but they don't appear in the documents again, and the Spaniards came back. Very briefly, um, this is what we think that first settlement may have been laid out like. We know that there was a very big wooden floored structure here, maybe the Casa de Municiones, or um, even a gun platform. Some of these round huts were occupied, or at least destroyed, during the 16th century. There are a number of rectangular buildings, <laughs> the red ones, scattered uh, around the edges. And at the northern end of, of where the Spanish occupation was, was what we believe is a defensive wall. This is a little bit different, more visible view of this. The, uh, oh, the wall the casa, the square structures, which we believe will are Spanish, and uh, the circular buildings that were Native American style, perhaps there already, perhaps built by the Spaniards in, in Tumuqua style. So just we're gradually tr working toward a more visual way to, to look at this. Um, Quickly, the kind of evidence that archaeologists um, get excited about and that let us know that these buildings were here are these dark soil stains. These, um, it'll let me do it, are these. This was the Casa de Municiones area built over a burned, you can see, a burned Indian structure as well. Uh, the, north, the wall that's been our focus for the last couple of years is also that kind of sill beam stain. It's a, there was set a beam, like probably a little bigger than a railroad tie, into the ground. 
maybe notching, and then uprights were constructed above that. It's a fairly common technique in, in Europe and other early American colonies. And um, the wall itself, we have now traced for over 200 feet across the north side of the settlement. And it would, that was a relief because you, couldn't, you can't claim that you have a fortified settlement without any fortifications. So um, we, we do believe this was a, a defense wall and that this was water on all of these the three sides. So thinking this is coming together is what this first settlement may have, have looked like. And the wall itself is still a mystery. I mean, if anyone who has any ideas, we would love to hear. You don't usually just have a single beam support for a wall, even if it's an earth and fascine wall. These are some examples from the Civil War back to medieval times of, of defensive walls might have looked like that. The buildings that people lived in, the, the square structures, this is a reconstruction by the late Albert Manusi. Uh, and these, the same kinds of stains, quickly, if I can make it stay on there. I'm going to zoom over and see that they're uh, wall stains and nails. We're having kind of a fuss with the architects right now because we had always assumed these were all thatch buildings. Um, because they were called boios by the Spaniards, but also we haven't found enough nails that we consider would be sufficient to have boards on all the buildings. But the architect uh, who we're working with, many of you know Herschel Shepard, well, of course they would take the nails. Nails are hard to make and hard to get. There's no way they would abandon the settlement and leave buildings with boards and nails. They probably took the boards too, he thought. So it's kind of an interesting thing that now we have to go back to the drawing table on. This is a museum sort of reconstruction of maybe from the interior of one of these buildings. And then scattered throughout among the buildings, barrel wells, trash pits, other kinds of stains. I won't go into too many of them, but enough to be clear that this is a mid 16th century European constructed settlement. The barrel wells have been you know, especially exciting. This turned out, we think, to be a storage pit. It had an end of a balance beam scale in the bottom, a brass hook scale. And uh, it was a military encampment. Certainly, there have been hundreds and hundreds of these small, um, sorry, these the little ones. Uh, they're lead shot made through a colander drop uh, method, which is a a kind of a medieval lead shot. They're the right kind for an arquebus. And these buttons that, although there were no uniforms at that time, Menendez did provide buttons uh, for his men to, to go on their doublets, and they were described as this kind of button. And a variety, I just put all these in one picture, of the kinds of things you'd expect in a 16th century frontier encampment. Um, the beads, many of which are the same kind that Jerry just described for DeSoto, um, the hawk's bells. Uh, these could be rosaries, they could be necklaces, they could be for trade, clothing items, and lots of Spanish pottery. This is a candlestick, the top half. There's one in uh, the Holland Museum that is uh, identical from the 15th century. And, uh, our favorite, little Figa, the clenched fist amulet used in Spain to protect babies. And it was made, made here. And although all of these Spanish items were brought here to be familiar, to recreate a, a settlement that would be like Spain, even at this early period, it's clear that the Spaniards were incorporating some Native American material into their lives in the same pit. In fact, we found all of these objects. <laughs> a shell that was in the bottom of a well, a shell cup, an olive jar, native pottery. So there, there's a, it was an early um, trend toward what we see so well developed later here in the households of St. Augustine. And this is a, an attempt at trying to reconstruct what this might have looked like. This will be ongoing. But as uh, noted, this particular episode did come to an end because of Temuco resistance. Uh, the Spaniards were driven away uh, and um, ushered in a time we heard 
particularly this afternoon from Jerry Milanich, of the tremendous changes this made in the social landscape of Florida, and America changed Florida, changed Native American life, conversion and, and missions. People, as he was saying, were moved all over the Southeast, epidemic disease, and really dramatic changes in the Indian material culture, which uh, Jerry has told us about. And there were Tumuquin survivors. We heard about one this afternoon, here or two. Um, Manuel Russo also emigrated from Florida. He was uh, born at Nombre de Dios, and he uh, was still here in 1763 and went to Cuba, uh, to Guanabacoa, uh, and died there. This is an earlier uh, Native American woman I think we all are familiar with, Maria Melendez. She was the cacica, the chief of Nombre de Dios, and the chieftainess of the entire region. And, bailed out St. Augustine with corn on various occasions. Uh, these, of course, nobody looks, knows what they really look like. These are artists' reconstructions. But they're just two of the amazing, fascinating people who lived here in the colonial era. Um, and it wasn't just the Spaniards to the end. There, there were people of mixed blood, Native Americans, African Americans, and, and Spaniards and Criollos. So I just wanted to conclude with uh, letting you know that if you, uh, I hope you'll look forward to learning about many, many more of the people who lived here that have been studied archeologically uh, as part of the uh, cooperative program between the University of Florida and the city of St. Augustine in maintaining this, many of the state-owned buildings, we are in the midst of developing an exhibit that uh, will highlight St. Augustine uh, as our first Spanish colony with the, the core idea that long before Jamestown, mm -hmm. Spaniards, free and enslaved blacks, and Native Americans crafted North America's first European settlement, St. Augustine, in the 1500s. Uh, there will be a uh, by June in Government House, at least in the lobby while the building is being renovated, a uh, small exhibit. So I hope you'll sort of think about this, think about you know, the reality of what Florida is. We really, I'm listening to Professor Cremona's talk this morning. She uh, brought up many ideas about the nature of America and our, our identity as Americans and that we're united at least by a political process. But I think in the notion of who we are as Americans, it would be wonderful if this um, observation of Spain and America, of Ponce de Leon and of St. Augustine could lead to a little more comprehensive idea of who we are as Americans in our roots. Uh, maybe uh, these, I'm sure these conferences that the Humanities Council is sponsoring will do a lot toward that in the teacher's workshop. So, I would invite you to keep your eyes open uh, for the exhibit, and um, if in the meantime uh, you'd like any more information about some of these, visit our, our website on the Florida Museum site. And thank you very much to all of you and to our major sponsors.